तीन हैं सोन Hey, fantastic. So I just want to say a good evening and a very warm welcome to the Wiener Holocaust Library. For those of you who have not joined us before, for those of you who have, welcome back. Um, my name is Kira Fitzgerald. I'm the library's education officer. And before we start the event, I just wanted to outline some general housekeeping to get the boring stuff out of the way. So this talk, will, or conversation rather, will last approximately for half an hour before we open up the floor to questions. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to take any online questions this evening, but also a very warm welcome to those joining us online. Um, after this, we would also love for you to join us at the drinks reception, reception which is also why um, some of you who are inquiring about drinks earlier have been put on hold till after the talk has been completed. Um, we're not expecting the fire alarm to go off. So if it does go off, please exit the building back the way through uh, which you entered. And if you need to use the restroom at any stage, it's down the corridor just to my left, um, down one flight in the lift to the Noor Inayat Khan, A Life of Courage. It's an event I've been particularly looking forward to as I'm actually currently researching the fascinating career of Noor and the incredible work of Shrabani for my, do uh, for my doctoral thesis. Um, so it was a real honor to be asked to host this event this evening. On the 13th of September, 1944, Noor Anayat Khan, a World War II British secret agent, was murdered by the Nazis in Dachau concentration camp. For her bravery, she was posthumously awarded the George Cross by Britain and the Croix de Guerre by France. Tonight, the Noor Inaya Khan Memorial Trust and the Wiener Holocaust Library invite you to remember her life and courage in a rare UK conversation between Noor's nephew, Pierzia Inayat Khan, a Sufi scholar, head of the initi... Forgive me for my pronunciation of this. Um, Iniatia? Fabulous, and founder of the Sulek Academy. Noor's biographer, Shrabani, ba uh, Shrabani Basu, author of Spy Princess, and chair of the Noor Anayat Khan Memorial Trust, and Sheikh Alma Sheikh, Noor's cousin and the only person in this room to have met and known Noor. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our speakers this evening. Thank you so much, Kira. It is, um, it's really apt that we are here today at the Wiener Library, so thank you for supporting us in this. Uh, and um, I just wanted to say before, uh, you know, we talk about Noor, there were four women who were killed uh, on the same day, on the 13th. They were all secret agents, so today we do remember all of them. Um, and their names uh, were uh, Nurinayat Khan, Madeline Damama, uh, Ilian Pluman, and Yolande Beekman. And all four were secret agents. They were all from the SOE, and they were all brutally killed. So um, 
we remember them all today. Uh, but today is about Noor, and what a privilege to have Sheikh Al Mashek here with us today, because he was the only one in this room. He is the only one in this room who actually knew Noor. So we're going to get some lovely stories. And Peer Zia, of course, he has been he has been looking after her archives. He has been finding material, and ever since. The book was published. I have got to know Peer Zia, and we've I've kept in touch with the family, with all of them, right through. And every time he discovers something, he sends it to me, and it's always a nugget. So we're going to go through many of the things today, and basically see, um, you know, where was Noor coming from? What is this background uh, that we can bring? You know, find out about her. We know about her wartime life, but what is it that drove her? This journey you know, that she went on. And um, I'm going to start, as I said, with uh, Sheikh Alma Sheikh, the only person who knew Noor. You were about nine years old when you first met her? I know, I knew her much earlier, mm -hmm. but not as early as Noor knew me. <laughs> Since um, the, when I was born, she was already a grown girl, not a teenager quite, but she was 12, 13 years old. And at that time, her father, Hazrat Inatran, had started encouraging her to take up contact with the family in India, in Baloda. So she started writing little chits, little letters about them, uh, to them. And so in one of the earliest letters, in a very childish hand, she writes that now we have a little cousin and his name is Mahmoud. <laughs> I didn't know her, she knew me. <laughs> Later on, of course, I knew her very well indeed. And it's so hard to do. I wish, you know, I were a poet or a painter. And unfortunately, I'm none of the two. But if I had been a poet or a bit, I could have evoked something of that personality of Nuronissa in a way which now I had to try to specify just in a few dull words. But there was something extraordinary about her. You know, her father has had overwhelming charisma. He himself had in turn inherited from his own grandfather. And both these two elder children of his, the eldest one was Noor, and her brother Vilayat, the later Pierre Vilayat, uh, they also had that extraordinary kind of charisma. Anybody, if you have, would have known Pierre Villard, Villard uh, maybe, then you can understand, you get some an image of that same kind of quality which Noor had. And um, it was fairly small, well, I thought, of course, as a small boy, I thought she was quite tall. But in fact, she was quite petite, quite small, but very, very lively, very intense also. And, well, a very, very... I mean, she's one of those people of whom, when you talk to her, when you just see her come, something lovely seems to go out from her, just to reach you, at the, at the particular person with whom she was happened to be dealing. So that was that extraordinary thing, and I kind of suspect that even when she was in a tragic a Nazi captivity, something of that must even have impressed these awful jailers of hers before that, of course, she was transported in an awful way to the uh, uh, destruction camps. But there was something, ex uh, something on the one hand, very focused, very tense, at the same time with a kind of joie de vivre, which always came out of her in all different conditions when you met. She was also very, had a high-pitched voice, <laughs> which made her sound very enthusiastic about things. And, uh, well, that was the, uh, the way she communicated with us all. Mm -hmm. You have a lovely story when I was researching the book and we spoke about how she taught you music. So oh. will you share that with us? Yes, with everybody here? if you have not yet know that, we'll mm -hmm. often ask to tell that story. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, Noor and also her sister and brothers came to stay, we were in Holland, they came to, stand, uh, to stay in Holland for some months, or some, quite a long time, several weeks, sometimes a month, with an uh, f f f f other family, another family of friends of Sufi Mourid, but very leading person in uh, persons, and so she, they used to stay with her. And then, of course, they came to visit us. 
And my father, knowing, of course, all her versatility in music, she played the harp, but she also played the piano. And so, what, why don't you try to teach her music to the, a little Mahmoud? He really should get some experience of music, so please do something about it. She was very enthusiastic. Don't forget that she studied, her study was child psychology. And so the, the many stories she wrote uh, in, in those days, in those years, were precisely attuned to that uh, uh, psychology she was studying, that oh, all was some kind of something to penetrate which a child might be attracted to but not quite understand. But the point of which could be understood by uh, adults uh, reading those uh, poems, which Pizzi has done brilliantly and he could discuss all his poems, uh, he published all his letters, uh, all the products collectively and so could tell all about these different f uh, forms of attention in which he uh, in her language, it was, was in that we was given was given expression. So um, that um, and then there are some, of course. Oh, I should tell the story. Yes, okay. you have my to tell us said, the special method she used. My father <laughs> said you were very naughty, so yeah. he was very naughty, and yeah. Noor had to uh, had <laughs> to a, teach him. <laughs> uh, yes, of course, it was naughty, and you know because my, my father and uncle were brilliant musicians. Uh, Noor herself and her brothers, they all be musicians. I knew nothing, not even playing the piano. So not, but I know, of course, I was very shy. And all these people are such experts, and I know nothing, how terrible it is, how humiliating it is, and how can I possibly cope? All right, no, it came. And what she chose to, to make me play is a so-called sonat facile of Mozart. <laughs> now, Mozart is a wonderful composer, but his, his sonat facile is absolutely not facile. So, <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not a, a starting student who just has to learn the ABC of the piano. So what did she do to smooth over my problems? She started telling me stories. And stories very akin to the kind of stories which Pizia was citing this afternoon. About, you know, on the one hand about fairies frolicking around, but also about hares and rabbits dance. Maybe she thought those fairies were a bit abstract for me in my young age. but very much even more about rabbits and, and, and uh, uh, hares and all this frolicking in the uh, gardens and how wonderful it was, that atmosphere and the joy. And she told, in that way, with all these stories, she made me play those notes of Mozart Sonata. <laughs> and I liked it very much. For the way certain uh, rabbits for the first movement, then we had other hares, uh, hares for the second movement, and they had different. Uh, connotations and different meanings. Oh, a wonderful story she told. <laughs> and naturally I thought, I thought well, oh, so these, these, these stories, these, hairs, these rabbits and these fairies, they of course belong to the music. <laughs> All right, she gave me some lessons of that kind and then she had to leave for France again and was without a, a music teacher. <laughs> but then fortunately her younger sister, Gerunissa, happened to stay with the same friends and she came to visit my father. He was a very, very different person, looked very different and was very quiet. She's a very, very self-contained, quiet person. So my father thought, well, and if she, she's a good musician, she knows to play piano, whatever. So let her continue uh, with Mahmoud's uh, uh, pia piano playing. All right. Geronissa, normally called Claire, she came, sat next to me, and I started playing. And then I was waiting for the fairies and the rabbits and the <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> then I said, I tried to, to remind her that she was failing on the duties to give that music <laughs> the obvious dimension which they needed. And she, she was kind of surprised. She, but that what I was saying, she just did not understand what I was saying. And then I said, well, she is no good as a music teacher. Never mind that. <laughs> if she doesn't know about rabbits and hares and fairies, then she doesn't know about music. <laughs> so after that first lesson, her lesson and the day, then and the <laughs> Oh dear. So um, I'm just going to explain for, uh, give the family tree to all of you so you know who's who and where they are. <laughs> right. So we have Noor's father, Hazrat Inayat Khan, and he came, when he went to the West, he, he took Sufism to the West. Um, so he traveled with his brothers, good Indian family, they all traveled together. And so he had two brothers, Mehboob Khan, Musharraf Khan, and they all went. And 
Uh, Sheikh Alma Sheikh is the son of Mehmood, right? Mehmood Me 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 Khan, yes. So he is the son of Mehmood Khan, so Noor's cousin. And um, now Pir Hidayat had uh, uh, Pir Hazrat Inayat, Mushar, <laughs> Mushir Hazrat Inayat Khan had four children. So Noor is the eldest, and then we had Vilayat, then we had Hidayat, and then Claire. Claire is the, the youngest, whose story you heard, <laughs> without, the, without the rabbits. And um, uh, Pirzia here is Vilayat's son. So Noor's, Vilayat, Hidayat, and Claire, and Pirzia is just giving you the little family tree so that you know who's who and where they are. <laughs> Um, and uh, Noor was actually very close to Vilayat. They were like in step the whole time. Yeah. And that yeah. is why when they decided to volunteer for the war effort, it came from Vilayat. And they said, we are Sufis. They had this meeting. They sat in this house in Fazal Manzil. They had this meeting and they said, this is the, f the German army is just on the outskirts of Paris, about to invade. And they decided that they couldn't stand by and watch. So both of them, they had this really important meeting. They said, we are Sufis, we believe in nonviolence, but we can't stand by and watch. And I think Vilayat at that time was a stronger personality. He was absolutely determined. He said, we go to England, we'll volunteer for the war efforts. And when they came here, he volunteered for the RAF. And Noor was just following, you know, with her brother said, well, I'll volunteer for the women's wing. And so she joined the WAF. But, uh, uh, Pirzia, you've heard the stories of Noor. You never met her, of course. But you heard the stories about your aunt from your father, who, when I interviewed him, said he thought of Noor every day of his life. And he, he would have spoken to you. So what are your earliest memories of your father telling you about Noor? And what did you think? You were a young boy. What did you think of this aunt? At that time, as a young boy, who, you know, your father was saying was such a heroine. Tell us. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for bringing us together. It's, it's on. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Thank you for uh, bringing us together, Shravaniji. And um, let me say, first of all, that I've noticed over the years that whenever there's been a significant uh, remembrance of Noor, the hand of Shrabaneji has never been <laughs> far away. In fact, yeah, it's been the, grading, yeah, yeah. the greater moving right. force that <laughs> made, made all this possible. So. so that's a very good question. Um, what were my father's recollections of, of Noor? Of course, he had many recollections, but what, which were those that he especially chose to pass along? Mm -hmm. And um, certainly I recall all through my life um, since my earliest memories, that um, whenever he spoke of Noor, there were always tears in his eyes. He never had dry eyes. It was a subject that, that wounded him to the core. <laughs> uh, he was so, all throughout his life, uh, he carried with him the, the, de the devastation of having been so close to a person he admired so deeply, he loved so deeply, and then to have learned of what she suffered. It was as if he suffered yes. that too, through his, through his closeness with her, through his empathy. So I absorbed from him this sense of tragedy um, immediately. And whenever uh, Noah's name was mentioned, it felt very heavy and weighty, even though I, I didn't know uh, the whole story until later on. But it was a subject that was charged with a kind of sacred intensity uh, that she, she represented for us a, an almost impossible paragon of uh, saintly heroism. And at the same time, her story uh, consisted of a of a tragedy almost too, too great to, to discuss. And so that was uh, the atmosphere growing up. And um, I do remember some of the well stories that you've just uh, summarized for us that he told me how um, when, that already, even before the Nazi um, conquest of, 
of France, just hearing reports in the news of what was going on in, uh, in Germany, and that um, the siblings were, well, particularly my father and Noor, were just uh, deeply offended to hear of the actions of the Nazis because they said it just ran against all of their ideals. It was totally contrary to all that they had been raised to, to value. Um, inclusivity, respect for human dignity and life, um, the sanctity of the great religious traditions of the world and the cultures that follow in the footsteps of the prophets. Uh, that, that people should be divided in this way and humiliated and, and, and persecuted um, absolutely uh, offended them and they were wondering how to respond. And already, even before um, Noor uh, and her family fled to London and then, um, and then joined the, the um, Allied cause, already she was thinking about how she could respond and it comes through in her stories. Mm -hmm her stories of heroism, and specifically the way in which she saw that the um, Nazis were co-opting the legacy of the Grimm brothers um, and pressing that German folklore into their ideological strategy of brainwashing uh, German ch children mm -hmm. and um, inculcating that in them a kind of exclusivistic um, uh, narcissistic pride in some kind of imaginary Germanness and hostility toward everything else. And certainly that was far from the intention of the Grimm brothers themselves. They were cosmopolitan, they were pluralistic, and um, that spirit was one that Noor appreciated. So she wanted to revive the true spirit of the Grimm brothers and show how the fairy tales of all lands are intertwined and the tales migrate from culture to culture and you can't try to build a, a wall around them and say these are the stories, exclusive stories of our people. So her, she's told stories from many lands and it was a conscious strategy of rhetorically challenging the ideology of Nazism, not only by um, showing how the world is interconnected but also her stories were stories of generosity and kindness and self-sacrifice and not domination and, and tyranny and cruelty. Mm -hmm. So that was her, her first um, way of um, meeting the, the, the Nazi um, threat. And then, so my father said, he told the story that you mentioned, which is that um, as the tanks were approaching Paris, they gathered in a, a special room in the house where uh, their father had meditated and they discussed between them uh, what they would do, and that they, they said two things. One is they saw that um, these Nazis were involved in a project that was essentially evil. And secondly, they remembered their, that their father had said, mm -hmm. had asked them specifically and said, um, if France is invaded, what will you do? Mm -hmm. So he must have been, he was prescient, he anticipated that. And my father said, that he answered his father saying, I wouldn't want to kill. He wanted to take a nonviolent approach. But apparently, what my father told me is that his father didn't seem fully satisfied mm -hmm. with that answer and said, if you eat the bread of a country, you must be prepared to defend that country with your life. Mm -hmm. So it was remembering that that uh, motivated them to make their way to Britain and then to volunteer for the war effort. You know, that's so interesting that you would say what Hazrat Inayat Khan told them about take a stand. And um, he would tell them, this again, what your father Pirvilayat said, that he would tell us that you have the blood of Tipu Sultan in your veins. And um, so Noor's ancestry was from, the, from Tipu Sultan, who was the ruler of Mysore. And he was known as the tiger of Mysore, and he died fighting the British, and his treasures are in the vaults in Windsor Castle and in the, the V&A, but that's another story. <laughs> and uh, we, um, but uh, Hazrat Inayat Khan would say that, you know, his, um, uh, you have Tipu's blood in your veins, and that must have had a profound effect on them. And I see them as, um, 
you know, they are Sufis, they are non, they believe in non-violence, but there's also, in both Hazrat Inayat Khan and them, and you could tell me, um, there's also the revolutionary streak in them. A little bit of, uh, you know, we've, we've got to do something, we're going to do it. <laughs> well, to be honest, um, the, the monarch that, that my father used to refer to when we were children was Genghis Khan. He said, remember, <laughs> you were descended from Genghis Khan. Goodness. So it wasn't Tipu Sultan. <laughs> But um, that was his way of uh, tracing an ancestry. Okay. But there's something else, if I may take this of moment, just, yes, to, yes. Uh, just to say that, um, you know, your book was very important for me at a certain point in my life. And I want to just mention that. So I, I, I already uh, spoke of how um, I grew up with a sense of awe toward Noor, but also that that, that awe was m uh, mixed with a, a feeling of, um, just the heaviness of the story and, and uh, all of the sadness that accompanied it. And so I wanted to admire Noor from a distance mm -hmm. and not actually come too close to her story. And, um, but then your book came out and... Yeah, there's a sound there. Okay. And um, I remember having it but not reading it mm -hmm. for a while for a number of months, and I just kept thinking, I know I need to read this, but something was, was stopping me. Mm -hmm. And so I started to read it, and it was very um, difficult. It begins with the, the idol of uh, her childhood and the, the, the halcyon days of the summer school in Seren and, and the presence of her father and then her university years and her stories, but then it goes, uh, into her um, recruitment and um, and her wartime service, and it gets darker and darker, and you f you feel you're following her on a path that you know is leading into hell, and it's hard to read, especially if you have a connection with Noor or any kind of sympathetic feeling toward her. It's a very difficult book to read, and so um, I felt like I was in uh, following after her into. Um, the Gestapo headquarters and, and into the, the Forsheim prison and finally to, to Dachau. And, you know, I, so I say, as I say, I resisted um, reading it, but in the end, it really uh, brought me closer to her because until then I had, I had not dared come that close. And, and since then, uh, she's been, you know, hovering over me, <laughs> guiding me, and even guiding me to discover mm -hmm. uh, writings of hers that previously weren't known. Yeah, so which is what I'm going to actually bring up now, um, is that uh, Pirzi has really made it his mission to find these archives, which you are still finding, which is amazing. Uh, because uh, I guess after the war, I mean, what happened to, what happened to the paperwork? Who took them? I think it was Sheikh Masha, it was your father, the uncles, they looked after many of the things when the family left, isn't it? Well, they were then in Holland. Mike, sorry. They were then in Holland, mm -hmm. and this, it, uh, cause, uh, connection with France were completely cut by the occupation. Mm -hmm. So they didn't uh, know much about it. It was rather that the a younger son, he died. He, uh, he transferred much of the papers and documents at Fazemanza to Holland. Uh -huh. To those home people who, with, where they used to be saying they had a large, large accommodation headquarters mm -hmm. and so on. So uh, much of what he took from Fazemans was later, later retrieved there in that archive. Right. I'm now right. part of the Sufi Museum oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, what a treasure. So recently, um, some of you may have been there. We, Pirzi has found some poems she's written, but also not just the f children's stories. He has discovered that mm -hmm. her essays written as a young adult, and he's brought them out. And most interestingly is a play she did, and I'm going to let Pirzia describe it. Um, she did a Sufi interpretation of the Odyssey. And um, Pirzia, will you summarize it for us? What, yes. Yes. what she did, what she did with the characters, who inspired her? Um, well, it's a fascinating work of art. Um, the title is Aid of the Ocean and Land. And as you say, it's a retelling of the Odyssey and it, it functions on multiple rhetorical levels. So um, on one level, it is a retelling of the Odyssey. On another level, it's a Sufi allegory, um, or you might say a Neoplatonic retelling of the Odyssey, 
which picks up on ways in which uh, Neoplatonic philosophers were um, interpreting Homer. Um, but specifically, she guides those interpretations in the direction of a Sufi allegoric, allegory that follows the, um, the story of the Conference of the Birds told by um, Attar, Sheikh Fariduddin Attar. So there are seven acts that correspond to the seven valleys of Attar's great Persian Sufi poem. But it also uh, works on yet another level, which is the autobiographical level. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you know her life story well, um, then it becomes very clear that she's also talking about her relationship with her father. And Odysseus, Ulysses in the, in the story, um, is her father Moshid, this, uh, this traveling uh, Sufi teacher. Uh, Ulysses is a traveler who finally comes home and her father in 1926 had finally come home after long travels. He had been in the United States and came home only briefly, um, only then to, to leave for, for India. And that was a journey from which he would not, not return. And so she was still pro she was processing um, his absence and um, the, the final moments that she had spent with him. And she fit that um, experience into a, a mythic narrative where in her telling of the Odyssey, Odysseus doesn't come back and vanquish the suitors and um, frankly torture the servants that had cooperated with the suitors, as uh, happens in, in uh, Homer's telling, but instead um, renounces his own estate and becomes a, a sannyasin, becomes a, uh, a, a Sufi sage. And so she saw him as going to India in order to find a freedom that hadn't hitherto been possible for him. But in doing so, she felt that he made the great sacrifice of leaving the family that was so dear to him. And he was so dear to them. And so in her resolution of that story, the family of uh, Odysseus, Penelope and Telemachus, Telemachus, the son of Odysseus representing Nur, Nur uh, follow after <laughs> Odysseus and together they roam in the wilderness. They find a new way of being together that is free of the former um, attachments and uh, all of the complications of mundane life that had proved a kind of prison. And they find a way to, you might say, spiritually travel. And I, un I interpret this as her realization of a way of being with the spirit of her father, uh, a way of being that was now unfettered and would enable them to spiritually voyage together into the great blue. It's, uh, and in fact, these books are now available, thanks to Pirzia, bringing them out through the Saluk Academy. So, um, yeah, I think they can be bought on Amazon, can't Dream they? Dream Flowers is the title. Dream, Dream Flowers. Flowers is the collection of uh, her, her essays, her short stories. It's actually like the collected works, which is absolutely fabulous. So, tell us about the name, Dream Flowers. <laughs> Well, and at yes. the, the cover, where she's in this started, tell us that story. Oh, yes, the cover. <laughs> yes, well, the two different editions with different covers. But um, so the, the title comes from, from a, a poem in which she speaks about sweet peas. And she says, flowers of my sweetest dreams. And that, I love that phrase. So we used it as the title of the book, Dream Flowers. And the, the cover of the first edition shows her on horseback wearing her... Um, Uniform, I think it's in the, the... There's a Scottish, uh, there's uniform? a tartan. Yes, yeah. the tartan also. Yeah. <laughs> so this, the story goes that um, Claire, whom you mentioned, Geronisa, she uh, saw Noor for the last time in an underground station. They happened to, to meet there, mm -hmm. and it just turned out that was the last time those two sisters met. But Claire asked Noor, where have you been? What have you been doing? And briefly she said, I've been riding 
I suppose that was part of her training. Uh, she had been riding on the downs. And she said, um, look for me after the war. I'll be riding the downs with our family tartan. So um, it came time to commission a, a portrait of Noor. And I thought, how will we portray her now that she's no more in this world, and I thought, let's portray her as she imagined herself after the war. What, what would she be doing? So according to Moshe, uh, the teachings of her father, you know, when a soul leaves this world, something of this life continues, and it continues according to the anticipation and desire and hope of that soul. So if she said that after this war, I'm going to be riding the downs, then I truly believe that in heaven, that's what she's doing. <laughs> And so we portrayed her that way and wearing that uh, lavender uh, tartan. So is, yeah. is there a family tartan that you have? It went from her mother's side and uh, okay. you come, she had a Scottish background and so we oh, traced it so and you it was traced the lavender, that. yeah. Okay, wow. So um, I just, before we go into what you describe as the darker side to her story, um, I just wanted to ask, you know, I want uh, Sheikh Almar Sheikh and, you know, who was there as a child, I just want you to recreate for everybody, what was the atmosphere like in Fazil Manzil? I mean, this music and the meditation that we hear about, um, yes. you know, a happy place. Just tell us about it. Yes, okay. well, the atmosphere was quite an extraordinary one. <clears throat> and it was, you know, the curious thing was exactly that same that happened in our family when later we moved to Holland. But the same thing, the, the uncles, the father and the uncles were there. And they had that extraordinary Indian uh, sense of being. They were great mystics, they were uh, great uh, ph philosophers, and uh, they were focused on all the spiritual values of India. And uh, in addition, of course, it was perfectly natural for them to speak their language, to adopt, continue the habits, the mentality, the attitudes, the behavior, everything would have been for normal for them. So that was really the dominant atmosphere as long as Moshe de Nathan and his brothers lived together. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, once Moshe had left, and around that same time also the brothers uh, left that joint family because, uh, well, my father had married, uh, the, the, other, the two, two of the brothers had married, one had joined uh, those others when they left. So certainly, Fazelman's was a very different place where the mother, Amina Begum, Sharda, the uh, uh, alternative name was, uh, became uh, uh, filled with memories, but filled with a kind of sadness. And uh, uh, the, the mother was almost uh, incapable of continuing a, a kind of conscious education of these young children. And that was what then fell to Noor, who herself was only maybe 13 or 14 years old, mm. to try to steer the younger children in a more or less normal life of children of that age would expect. But of course the transition from that one atmosphere which was wholly authentically Indian and suddenly that evaporating and you know it's a kind of like a kind of modulation in tone and, ver and it was of course a very hard thing. They continue to go as much as possible continue the memory and the practices and whatever they knew of the father. But still, of course, it was a very, well, it, uh, I would say it was an operation without anesthetics. Mm -hmm. That is what that loss was. Mm -hmm. And so then they had one more or less to had to fend for themselves. Their uncles being in Holland, they used to come and visit them there, but it still was not the same thing as being together in a joint family, of course. And um, so each of them had to strike out on their own. And, of course, both uh, Nuru Nissa and her brother Vilayat were the most, as I said, the most capable, the most charismatic, the most definite people. They most consciously chose a way of their own. And uh, that continued. As I said, Nuru started writing little chits to the family in India. Her father had already encouraged you to do so. She continued that. Very few of these chits have somehow survived time and are still now, uh, they have still been preserved, and most of them after the time of Mujtinatra himself. And so that was one link which they had feeling that yes, they were the origin, there was their 
Asliyat, the, the, the genuine background, and so he reached out to that. Mm. And uh, on the other hand, of course, they were trained in music, they were trained academically at the same time. Both Vilat and Noor uh, had this dual uh, higher education that again gave them a certain togetherness, but at the same time, each is a particular specialism. Uh, Vilat studied uh, cello, he studied with uh, Casals and uh, celebrities of that time, and Noor of course played harp, she played piano, and so on and so forth. So, yes, there was a, a kind of a next phase in which the children kind of, as much as possible, retained as, as far as they could of their father's atmosphere, of his memory, of his way of doing things, etc. But still, of course, having to maneuver. After all, they were half American, and they lived in a very modern France, which is rather different if you are an old-fashioned India, you come from 19th century India. So obviously, there was a lot of adaptation they needed, a lot of trial and error. Where can I do something about my Indian heritage, and where do I have to proceed on my own, etc. It was a very difficult position, really. And, uh, uh, and Noor used to compose, isn't it? So, in fact, you found some of her compositions. And to see these manuscripts with her writing and then signed Noor and Nisa uh, and, you know, her compositions, it's just um, yes, just yes, beautiful yes, to see them. So, you know, thank you for finding these. They're like treasures, which, you know, I just look at sometimes. In her neat handwriting, she's sort of done, done the notes and everything. It's beautiful. Um, so we're going to move on to, we don't have much time, I know there's lots of questions, so um, I'll probably make this maybe this last one from my side and then open it up. Um, so when, you know, we're talking about the influence of her family, her father's teachings, uh, I always felt that when she was in Forza in prison and she was shackled, you know, 10 months beaten and tortured, and the way she kept her spirits up, she must have meditated and thought about her father. And that is the only way she would have got through that. I mean, what do you think? I'm, I'm a lay, you know, outsider just seeing this, but I'd like to hear from you. Yes, yes. Well, um, her father, as you know, was a, a teacher of meditation and a, a very serious practitioner of meditation. And um, the, the methodology he used is one that um, it derives from Indian tradition and it um, reflects Sufism as it uh, evolved in the uh, environment of, of uh, yoga and uh, Vedanta and Buddhism. The whole culture of, of India is meditative and in fact there's been a lot of cross-pollination uh, and, and mutual um, influence between the various traditions and, and Sufism was, was part of that ongoing culture for centuries. And so she was steeped in that, in that heritage and, um, and, and absorbed it with her mother's milk, so to speak. It was, it was in the air. So um, meditation was part of her being. And so not only would she have been raised to believe uh, in the soul, but she was raised to actually experience the soul and to experience a dimension of life that includes, but also transcends, our physical condition. And so she would be able to um, experience her suffering within that larger context. Uh, that's not to say that she wouldn't have suffered. She suffered terribly. But at the same time, she was able to have recourse to a dimension of being that precedes this body and and survives this body and inheres throughout, uh, no matter what we are going through, in a state that isn't determined uh, by the um, accidents befalling our, our physical form. It has its own um, sphere of uh, light and, and life, and no doubt she was able to tune into it and um, gain solace and gain motive power from her soul, and I, I can't think of how else um, anyone could have shown as much courage and determination as she did. Mm -hmm. Because despite all that, she never gave away anything. She did not break. And I mean, I'm not judging, but there were male colleagues of hers who, who gave away names. Because one is not judging. You don't know what you can do under, you know, when you're in Nazi interrogation and torture. So, uh, but they did. And the, the point is that Noor didn't. 
And even when she went down, I mean, you know, you do say it is a dark story. Of course it is. But for me, at the end of it, when she goes down shouting Liberty, yeah. I think that's it. You know, that was the inspiration. Mm -hmm. So for me, her story, it goes beyond that darkness to light, much like her name. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear yours. Well, you know, the remarkable thing is the very first publication of Mujdi Nath Khan uh, in English, which was a very much kind of a catechism of Sufism, as he learned it from his own teacher, at a very slight kind of volume. But he called it a Sufi message of spiritual liberty. Now we know what Sufi means, what the Sufi message is, but he again combined the two great traditions, because liberty is the way in Hinduism you define the mm -hmm. ultimate fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So here again, already Mujdi Natran's first book was based on the togetherness of the Indian and the, the Indian Sufi tradition, combining these two mm -hmm. great traditions. And her last word was precisely that same word of liberty that, uh, yeah, for him, for them marked the kind of the fulfillment of spiritual life and the spiritual search for ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. So I find it very, very significant and very inspiring that that should have been her last uh, conscious consciousness in meeting her in that way. That's a fantastic place to now open the floor. If there are questions, we have about 10 minutes for questions, less than 10. Yes. Can, can you tell us anything about the grand parents? Sorry, one second, just about online. Uh, can you tell us anything about the grandparents of, of Noura and uh, whether they, in different ways, influenced their development? Grandparents. grandparents. <laughs> Not not directly, because the grandparents in India uh, had died long before that. In Atran did not leave India before, as long as his parents were alive. And only after his father died, then he felt free to travel abroad. So that was, uh, and of course, well, his American, uh, the dear American family on the mother's side was quite against everything that this Indian marrying our American thought. So that was no, no contact either. But one thing was there, and that's one thing which I know very well because it happened in our case, my sister myself also. They were full of stories, and daily, not only they had this meditation, but something of their whole life stream was involved with the memory of the family in India. And that was very much included their parents, and included their maternal grandfather, who was the head of the whole family, the kind of patriarch. And so, precisely, as I said, as long as they were there together, those stories, they continued, and they continued with the children. I often remember the people that asked me, how was this and how was that, and do you know about So they were still involved with the memory of that Indian background. Maybe I'll just briefly add something to that, uh, that which is that um, I recently had the opportunity to meet a, a lady who knew Noor as a, as a child. She had been a student of Noor. Uh, because at Fazal Mansal, at her father's house, she used to give Sufi classes when she was in her 20s. And Sufi children used to come and listen to her, and there were various subjects. And one of the subjects was um, a lesson, the title of which was Little Inayat. <laughs> and so her father's name was Inayat, and this was Little Inayat. So it was, a, it was a lesson about how, when her father was a child, what he had been taught by his parents. And she said, you know, little in Ayat was told not to uh, follow people around when they don't want your company and little things like that. Um, so, um, and she had, so she was reflecting something that her father told her that his parents uh, told him. And so it passed down the generations that way. Yeah. In some commentaries about Noor, her suitability is questioned, and sometimes some unkind things are said about her. Um, I think some of these things actually her strengths were saying about, you know, she didn't give anything away, and in her training, things were said like um, she didn't want to lie, um, that kind of thing. Um, so I wonder whether you will reflect upon those criticisms, actually they can be turned into strengths, but also 
um, may, maybe if there were some concerns that perhaps she shouldn't have been sent, um, and was it because of her, you know, her bilingualism, etc., desperation? Um, I just wondered how you thought about that. Because like, I wonder today whether we'd have sent her at all. We'd have said, no, actually, there's something else that you can do, whether we were desperate um, and she shouldn't have gone. Uh, well, uh, you know, you, Shrabini, you've been asking the questions, but you're the one who has really detailed knowledge of uh, Noah's wartime career. I would like to turn to you, if I may. I can, I can answer that. Um, well, basically, yes, there were objections to her because she was she was not a, a typical spy. She was an unlikely spy. Somebody who says, I'm not going to lie. I mean, you're going there with a false passport. <laughs> so that's, that's the first lie. So, yes, but Noor was pragmatic. And I think what happened is there was this impression of her that, you know, she's a dreamer. She'll never, never do what, you know, she might let down the side. She might give away things. She might be so... Uh, she'll be so nervous, so tense, face this dreamer, this, you know, petite woman cannot face the Gestapo. And I can see why people thought that, many, many in her training school. She was scared of weapons, so her report says scared of weapons, obviously she would be. But in the same report it says, but tries very hard. So I see Noor as somebody who knew that, okay, she, she didn't want to do it, but she felt she had to do it and she was going to train. The same reports say she is very loyal, she runs very hard, spends a lot of time on physical activity, you know, training herself. So she knew what she had to do. And I think many of her seniors saw that side to her. They saw the steely side. They knew that Noor had an inner strength, which was, you know, there was sort of, we saw later that she did not crack. So they saw that side to her. Uh, and. Uh, of course, the other thing that went against her, you know, which people objected to, was that she was very beautiful. And as a secret agent, you're supposed to blend, you know, not, not have the whole turn, <laughs> have a room turn as you enter, as they say. And that's what she would do. One of her interpreters says, he melted to chutney when she walked into the room. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that's not ideal in that sense. But of course, um, you know, she was there. She did what she had to in the field. If she hadn't been betrayed, she'd have been back and we'd have heard her story. So, and of course there were mistakes made in, we can't go into all the details, but it's in the book, but there were many mistakes made in London headquarters where her messages were not, not dealt with properly. So a lot of, there were a lot of repercussions from that, some very tragic repercussions, but those were not Noor's fault. So that's, hopefully that answers something. <laughs> Sorry, are you? <laughs> no. um, yes, any, anybody else with any, any other questions? Burning queries? You're not going to get both of them on a platform here <laughs> together very quickly. So if any, any questions which may not be related, it's on Sufism, on philosophy, here's your chance. I see a hand. <laughs> I don't know who it is. Thank you so much. I was, I was wondering when uh, uh, Peer Nath Khan was in London, around 1917 to 1920, whether we have found any archival material about the Islamic associations he was uh, involved in in those days. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so basically, um, actually we have the expert here, Kahira, can tell you what she has been researching. Would you like to take that? Yeah, because you're the expert. I mean, I know that he gave concerts um, during the First World War, uh, because I wrote a book on the First World War, and he's in the records there. He, he gave concerts to the Indian soldiers. He sang before Gandhi and brought tears to Gandhi's eyes. And, um, but, you know, I just know a little bit, but Kahira can tell you more. Okay, well, I'll try, thank you. Um, so he, uh, as well as um, doing the music, uh, musical evenings and a developing group of uh, followers uh, for his teachings, he did set up an association called the Anjuman Islam, which was to help, um, uh, I think, mainly Indian Muslims coming to London and giving them a welcome and uh, a basis. Um, and um, and also there were in the there was a magazine that was produced uh, 1915 to 1920. Uh, where there were notices about asking for donations for, for the Anjuman Islam and also for um, 
the uh, an orphanage. Uh, uh, so it, I, I wasn't quite sure in terms of the question. Was it uh, particularly about um, his work with Islam during London? Okay. So, the, certainly, as Shrabani said, he uh, he and his brothers and um, performed for the Indian soldiers, and um, uh, there was a story about um, when he was improvising one song that. Um, it was taken as being uh, supporting the national movement uh, of independence in India. And so he, he, they were not invited to continue that further. Um, there's also um, the story of, uh, I mean, he was, there, there is a file in the British Library and um, he, uh, he, it was partly his wife's family um, sent someone to seek out uh, his wife who had uh, left her family in America. And um, there was also letters between the Secretary of State for India um, and uh, the police. But uh, once it was discovered that they were legally married and everything was fine, um, I think the... Uh, the um, following stopped but there is a, a wonderful story about them being followed by someone um, when they went to France and finally they they turned around and asked uh, for advice as to where they should um, stay and this man um, so who was following them I don't know whether it was for the police or for MI5 um, took them to a certain place and, and therefore was able to um, keep them under his eye for a certain amount of time. In fact, one of the reasons they left London actually was because um, they said it's free, it's France is friendlier, you, it, you're, you're better off there. And then that's how they moved. Um, one last question before we, okay, yeah. And this will be the last, so you better make it good. No pressure. So that was a really very moving and very uh, uh, touching discussion. Um, I'm just referring back to Shabani, the earlier event in which the High Commissioner spoke about, uh, you know, the multicultural element of uh, Noor's family, um, both in terms of, uh, you know, the beautiful Sufi background that she comes from, as well as the, you know, her mother having uh, both uh, a Hindu name as well as... Uh, uh, Christian name and all. Could you just shed some light on because that was news to me. So uh, that multical, and I think she wrote a book on Buddhist uh, Jataka tales as well, didn't she? So there's a beautiful element of multiculturalism that comes through. Anything that you can shed some light on, that'd be lovely to hear. Thank you. Well, you you did cover it. I mean, it is her family, of course. Her father's Indian, her mother's American. She's born in Moscow, comes to London, goes to, lives in Paris. I mean, you know, that's it in a summary. You can see. Um, it's an international family and because her father is uh, lighting a candle to every religion every day, he starts this universal worship, so you know there is this atmosphere of tolerance and I'm saying what Pir Zia should be saying but I'm saying it very quickly because it's the last <laughs> question. But yes, and when Noor, well apparently she had a friend Jean and um, Jean said that she used to say that after the war she'd love to be some sort of ambassador, UN, you know, like because the UN didn't really exist then, but she said she'd love to be an ambassador um, to bring countries together. I don't think she believed in borders, and she was an international person, and she wanted to use that skill. So she was multicultural, she was, you know, there were no borders for Noor, she was an international person, and I think that's, that's important. But would any of you like to say one last thing before we end today? Okay. <laughs> well, you've said a lot, and it's just been wonderful. So, thank you, Pirzia. Thank you, Sheikh Mashek. What a treat. <laughs>